Well, welcome to the uh, session on the Environment and Care Committee. Uh, no one ever told me this would be a part of my job. Um, you know, my experience on the committee, I guess I would have to consider myself somewhat fortunate in that um, I sat on the safety committee from a clinical engineering perspective for the better part of five years. And so, you know, I had the opportunity to observe a committee function and an opportunity to participate in environmental rounds. And I had the opportunity to um, get a little bit familiar with, you know, the Joint Commission and standards and, and the environment of care standards. At the time, um, the environment of care standards had uh, seven sections. And um, since then, that's changed. It's no longer seven sections. Uh, it's actually one section for the, or five for the environment of care. Uh, they broke out life safety and emergency management into separate sections. Um, but I did have that advantage. Uh, very often, though, many folks, they may sit on that committee for a short while, and then for some reason or another, um, they get named the safety officer. Now, this is going to be an pr uh, interesting presentation in that it's really, as far as slides go, it really isn't going to be much. Um, as a matter of fact, um, there's going to be just one slide. And it's this slide. EC010101 EP1. Leaders identify an individual and individuals or individual individuals to manage risk, coordinate risk reduction activities in the physical environment, collect efficiency information, and disseminate summaries of actions and results. It's one of those moments where you look at something like this and you really don't realize everything that is inside of this one statement. Um, I think the reason why I decided not to break the session into a bunch of slides is because looking at your assignment this week, basically that is your assignment. Your assignment is to go through um, the environment of care standards and to break it down for the ones that, and again, I, this is interesting, as I look through the standards, um, on one hand, you could you could associate nearly every element of performance in all the standards to the safety committee. However, and this is kind of a heads up for you, for those of you doing your, your assignment, that's really not the objective. Um, one of the things I want to do through this lecture and one of the things I want to do through this assignment is to start to make you keenly aware of the power of delegation and the power of doing a very intentional work. Um, you know, I've sat on a number of committees over the years, and there is a tendency um, for committees to sort of, if you will, run amok. Um, in fact, uh, to be candid, um, the two times that I became the safety officer at my two different facilities, each time before I became the safety officer, uh, the safety meetings ran anywhere from two to three hours every month. And in both instances, um, we, I reduced that time to somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes on an average, sometimes less than 30 minutes, and occasionally we'd run longer. We'd actually run um, over an hour. And I'm going to clarify a little bit on that in a moment, too, because uh, I start combining things into my safety meeting for the sake of getting things done that actually sometimes made that meeting go two hours. But when you hear what I did, you're going to understand that it really wasn't a two-hour meeting. In any case, though, this line here encompasses so many responsibilities. And again, going back to your assignment, um, there are so many responsibilities. You have to have a team approach. You have to have a multidisciplinary approach. I know that in some very, very small facilities, um, you know, you wear a lot of the hats. And as a matter of fact, if you think about the hats I wore at my last position, I'm a small to medium-sized hospital, um, I was the safety officer. But within the environment of care, I had reporting to me clinical or medical equipment, security, and safety. I had utilities reporting to me. Um, I also had the... Um, um, I guess I guess you would say fire equipment would report uh, my direction, and project management reported my way as well. And I also had you know some other departments, but those when you look at the um, chapter, 
all those cover pretty much everything in the environment of care for the most part. The only thing that didn't really cover reporting to me was some of the outside environmental issues and some of the employee health type issues, which, which actually belong to employee health or HR, but still they, they were on the committee. And then the emergency management coordinator. Well, there's the emergency management chapter. And then, of course, the last one is life safety. Aha, I had that as well. So I had some direct responsibility or I had reporting management reporting responsibility to me for nearly everything in all those sections. So, you know, as a safety officer, I didn't just have responsibility to be the safety officer. There was also multiple management plans. Oh, I think I did forget one, and that was hazardous material. And that was the only other one I, I didn't have directly. The environmental services director and department was separate um, at my second facility. Where at, at my first facility, it did report to me. So... Uh, so basically, when you look at the environment of care, very often you'll find that folks in facility management positions have the majority, in, in, in rare cases, all of these areas of, of responsibility through either themselves or their managers. So it does make sense that the healthcare facility manager is intimately involved. Even in large organizations, um, you're going to find that obviously utilities and you're going to find that uh, very likely um, life safety and fire safety are going to be intimately tied in project management to facilities. So while you may, even in a large facility, you may not have responsibility for all in the majority of the areas, you're very likely going to have responsibility for a good number of areas within these sections. So, you know, so, so any way you look at it, I think as a facility manager and a facility leader, you're going to be very, very intimately involved in safety committees. If not, in charge of the safety committee. Now I keep saying safety committee and uh, the Joint Commission is clear to say that you don't have to have a committee. But again, my point of this lecture is whether you call it a committee or whether you call it a group or whether you call it a gathering or whatever you call it, um, you need, it takes more than one person. It really, really does. It's, I, I don't know how it's possible to do all the things in one person very effectively. Um, you might be able to get the the documentation in order and you might be able to you know um, you know just do a minimalist approach if you have to do everything but you're really not going to I don't know how one can be very effective uh, doing it try to do it all themselves and ironically to some degree that kind of was the way it was years ago um, but I'm gonna what I want to talk about a little bit is you know uh, when it comes to being the safety officer this is a great opportunity to build collaboration. It's a great opportunity to build efficiency. Um, it's also a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot about other areas of um, responsibility within the organization. Um, anymore, the safety committee or safety folks report to the performance improvement or risk management uh, part of the organization because we're always doing uh, performance improvement as part of the safety committee. So you build relationships with risk management and performance improvement. And so you really have a unique opportunity to uh, get to understand a lot more about the hospital and the organization than you would otherwise. The other thing with safety committees, and I always work towards this, is that you get an opportunity to stretch other people. In other words, when you create your subcommittees, and we'll talk about that at some later point, but when you create effective subcommittees, it is important and I think it is very good to take folks from other disciplines and populate them into subcommittees that they don't normally, you know, they, they don't have direct responsibility over. You know, you might have somebody out of a cardiovascular department or environmental services, and they you will you'll put them on a security subcommittee. And I think that that often creates, uh, it's very interesting what it creates. I think very often they get very interested in the environment of care. As a matter of fact, over the years, I have found that clinical folks, nursing folks, really like the environment of care because for the most part, the environment of care is measurable. You know, you do your inspections. You know, you complete your tasks. And you can look at it, you can do it, and you can check it off. And I think in the nursing world, from what I've heard from my nursing peers, is that, you know, in nursing, it seems to be a little more ambiguous, or at least it has historically. And so when they, come to, when they come to the environment of care and you get nurses involved, they really love it because they feel like they're getting closure an awful lot. And you check it off. So I've, I've had nursing and nurses who've gotten involved in environment of care. Be, they love to get involved in fire safety. They love to get involved in protection services, 
uh, even utilities and things like that. So it's a, it's a neat opportunity to get people to stretch a little bit and get to get a different perspective. And so again, I, I look at the safety officer role and I look at the responsibility of the safety committee as a tremendous learning opportunity for everybody in the committee. And I think that that's always been my approach when, it come, when it's come to safety. Now, again, the other thing I've always approached is I don't like to waste a lot of time. I, I, I always drove me crazy when we had two and three hour meetings and I sat in those meetings. And I really came to sort of a kind of a, a, a common solution that I actually I've, I've used not just in safety committees but um, in pretty much any committee that I operate. And the first thing is, and we're going to talk about this uh, later on, um, maybe not in this um, course, but we will talk about this uh, in courses in the future, um, and that is Robert's Rule of Order. Um, I know that folks have heard Robert's Rule of Order. I uh, imagine the majority of you have heard it. I even imagine that many of you um, have operated under Robert's Rule of Order uh, under committees. The irony with that is many, many people know about Robert's Rule of Order, and many, many people use Robert's Rule of Order. But I would go out on a limb here to tell you that the majority of people don't use Robert's Rule of Order effectively or the right way or consistently. And and while I, I'm going to say and tell you that I know that I don't do it 100% correctly, but I have tried over the years to incorporate at least the major components and the the fundamentals of Robert's Rule of Order into my meetings. And I'm going to go over just with you a little bit. Again, this is kind of off, off, off the hip. I'm not reading it. I'm not looking at it. I didn't research Robert Rules of Order for this, um, this lecture. But I'm going to tell you some of the key points that I have found, I believe, have been very effective when it comes to managing a meeting and how Robert's Rule of Order tangibly and in a very common sense way helps you manage meetings. The first thing is, is that there is this perception that the chairperson of Robert's Rule of Orders um, gets to vote. Um, and also there's the perception that the chairperson gets to make the majority of the input. That is one of the perceptions I've seen over and over again. This person is the chair and so everyone acts as if, well, that person's in charge. And very often that chairperson at safety committees is the safety officer. The fact of the matter is the safety officer or the uh, chair in Robert's Rule of Order, in fact, probably speaks um, the least because in Robert's rule of orders what the chairperson does is they facilitate the discussion that is their primary role is a facilitator and maintain timing and movement and to you know to basically and to break ties when voting occurs and so that is, a, again, that is one of the major, major misconceptions. And I have seen that happen so often. Um, and, and when that happens, what, what happens very often is, is that it becomes almost a dictatorship by the person who is um, the chair. And that's that, and I, again, I, that has amazed me. Now, ironically, um, when you follow a structured process like Robert's Rule of Order for, for conducting meetings, there will be people who will act like you're a dictator because you're following it. Because what it does is it's sort of in a way it keeps things moving. And maybe another way of saying that is it muzzles some people. And that's what I have found to be, in my opinion, very often very effective. Because what I have found in meetings in the past is, is that there's always seems to be a person or two or three sometimes that take over a meeting. And you can't muzzle them. Um, they're going to go on for quite some time and they're going to inject uh, and re-inject over and over again. And that's one of the key fundamental things about Robert's Rule of Order is it sort of, it sort of mitigates that. It doesn't eliminate it. And at times you have to use that with some discretion, but for the most part it really does, when followed, reduce it. And so again, they may, t may say you're a tyrant for doing that, when in fact you're really just trying to control, conduct, and move the meeting forward. So that is one of the key elements that I found is interesting as far as the chairperson goes. The other part that I, I have found very interesting when you follow or the lack of following Robert's Rule of Order is the process of making motions and discussion points. 
Um, again, in most situations, people don't understand that when a motion is made, there is no discussion on that motion until someone seconds it. And only after it's second does discussion pursue. Over and over and over again, what I've seen in meetings is I have seen folks make a motion and then this long discussion goes on and then there's like this second that goes on and then there's a vote. And I, I know that uh, I know that if you've been to many meetings, you've seen that. And people don't seem to understand what the, what the intent of the m what what that is. Now, the other part that's we're making motions it's very very interesting and this is where the chairperson is supposed to be very engaged the chairperson is supposed to state the motion before it's seconded so that everybody understands what is being second um, again over and over again I see someone make a motion um, there's all this discussion then there's the second and to be honest nobody really knows at times what the original motion is each person thinks they know what the emotion is and that that becomes a very and to me it's almost that's been hysterical at times when I mean I'm in a meeting and I'm going and also there, there, someone is having all this discussion I said wait a second um, or they're trying to second the motion I said what's the motion and I have in more than one occasion seen four or five different variations of what they think they're seconding come out <laughs> and so we end up spending a lot of time going okay Let's make sure we understand what this motion is. And again, what we end up doing is writing it down. And so everyone knows, oh, this is the motion that we're seconding. And in fact, it's funny. It's, I, I, again, if you're in a meeting and, you ever, and you're going to, again, I, I think that as you go through your careers and as you become committee chairs and as you fall into Robert's Rule of Orders, you'll find similar things. So the chairperson is supposed to state the motion. So that's clearly stated. Uh, really, technically, the person who state who who originated the motion is supposed to state it, but the chairperson makes sure it's clarified and stated, so that way then it gets seconded. So it's it's a very interesting concept. But again, you can you can appreciate how that creates very clear communication, and if you don't do it, then you get very unclear communication, and people don't really know what they're voting on um, or what they're discussing. Well, if you do it the right way, then discussion does ensue. And the way discussion occurs, again, this is one of the other points that I think is very important about Robert's rule, is that the person who makes the motion opens up as to why they made the motion, why they believe it should be supported. And then you get to go around the room with people getting to state their reasons for supporting or not supporting the motion. And this is a very important part because... Um, this allows everyone to input versus people to dominate. Once you state your piece, if you will, you don't get to interject back in to it. Okay, you don't get to interject back into the conversation. You get to say your part and you move on. Now, again, using discretion, there are times where you do have injections back in, but you got to be very careful about that. And then what happens is, and this is another critical piece of when you're when you're making conversation about accepting or rejecting the, the motion. Your conversation, whatever you're stating about the emotion, is directed, guess where? To the chair, to the leader. That's who you're talking to. You're looking at them, you're speaking to them, and you're addressing them. And why is that done? Well, it keeps the emotion down. If you start, if you if you got a, a, a sort of a, a difficult issue to, to address or deal with, and there is disagreement, and that's not often, but it does happen for sure. Uh, especially when safety committees, it's a little more, I think it's better. But I've also been, <laughs> the, I've had the fortune of being the president of a homeowners association for multiple years. Um, and you want to talk about um, learning an awful lot <laughs> about people disagreeing? <laughs> In fact, and that's a classic example, homeowners association. Very often, someone has a problem with somebody else in the community or in the neighborhood. And they want something done. And they bring an issue to the committee. And they go, we go use Robert's rule of order. And trust me, there's a lot of emotion on both sides. And, and they'll want to yell at each other. They'll want to scream at each other. And, and when you follow Robert's Rule of Order, you tell them they do not address each other. They address the chair. And again, and then sometimes the emotion comes after the chair because the chair is controlling the conversation. But again, the ideal is to keep the emotion down. So you address the chairperson. That's who you address when you're having your discussions and you're making commentary about the motion. And again, these are some of the core pieces right there. Those are the ones, really, those are really the, 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 the core pieces. Now, iron, the irony here is 
during the motion being made and during the discussion, the chairperson does not, does not discuss, does not vote in favor or does not discuss for or against the motion. Now they do vote on ties. If there's a tie after, you know, you know, after the, after, after the discussion occurs, you didn't go through and say, are there any modifications to, um, um, to the motion? If there are no modifications, then you go to a vote. Uh, if there are modifications, guess what? You get to open up discussion again because you've changed the motion. So that, that does happen, but not often. But it, well, actually, it does, ha it does happen fairly often. Um, but then you modify the motion. You have another discussion, but usually it goes quicker. Uh, because the motion has been approved, and then you go to a vote. If it ties, then the chair finally gets to vote, and only then. Now, I'm going to give you a secret, and it's really not a secret, but I'm going to give you an insight about the chair. The chair is a very influential position, and it's a very influential person. And in a meeting, though, the chair, for the most part, except when there's a vote, is one of the weakest positions at the meeting. They really don't have the ability to influence things very strongly. They have the ability to move things forward, make sure there's clarifications, uh, and all that. And I think there is a tendency, and I've seen it over and over again, especially with strong personalities, for the chairperson to want to influence the meeting. And they want to inject, and they want to participate, and they can't. Because they themselves, to a certain degree, are muzzled. However... Where the power of the chair exists is before the meeting, after the meeting, in the hallways. That's what a chair does to build consensus or to build collaboration. A chair, knowing that an issue is coming up or maybe will table an issue, will go out and educate folks on the issue and build a coalition that way and just those key points I just gave you right there will help move issues forward very quickly as a matter of fact one of the key elements too is to make sure that things don't unless they're urgent don't drop onto the chairperson um, in a meeting things don't just pop up that's why you really need to have an agenda and you need to follow your agenda um, and if anything's gonna be brought to the chair to the table it gets brought at the beginning of the meeting, and even then, it may not be brought in at that meeting because if it requires education or information or data or something else, it may get kicked to another meeting so you can educate yourself and the committee can get educated. Or, and this is what I'm leading to next, or it goes to a subcommittee. And again, a very, in my opinion, a very critical, important part of conducting a meeting is that you create your subcommittees. When it comes to the environment of care, um, creating subcommittees based on um, the different uh, sections, I think, is probably still the best way to do it. I, I really do. Uh, but before you even create the subcommittee, you have what's called a steering committee. So you have a group of three, maybe four people that are the most knowledgeable people, or not say knowledgeable, but, but you'll take people who generally have a certain amount of seasoning or experience, and you will make them the steering committee. So when someone does bring an issue to the safety committee, it goes to the steering committee. And that steering committee pretty much has a couple of choices. One, it doesn't he listen. It, 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 it says this is not an issue for the safety committee. It belongs somewhere else, and so it directs it that way. Or two, they say, you know what? This should go straight to a department. This is, again, not an issue for the safety committee. Uh, it goes right to a department, and you send it off to a department. Three, you say, you know, for this issue, um, we are going to bring it to the whole committee. Very rare, but it happens. We bring it to the whole committee, and it goes straight to the committee. Again, listen to what I just said. Very rare. So rarely do issues come straight from someone saying, we want to talk about something to write to the committee. Okay? Now, there are exceptions. Trust me. When an administrator says they want to say something, well, they, 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 have, the, they, have, the, they have the microphone. So, But in, in many cases, when you're conducting a good committee, things do not go straight to the committee. Um, and in fact, where they do go is they often, if they come to the committee at all, they go to a subcommittee because very often that issue is related to one of the environmental care um, standards. It may be a medical equipment issue. It might be a utility issue. It might be, again, a safety or protection issue. 
And so you, that's you say, hey, this is actually a protection issue. It has to do with, you know, badges, or it has to do with control access, or it has to do with, you know, children's accessing, you know, children running around in the building after hours from the neighborhood, you know, things like that, or hanging out in the cafeteria, you know, at midnight. Um, so those kind of things would go to maybe security. You say, okay, security, you investigate this, you look into this, and then uh, you bring it back to the safety committee with a recommendation. And again, which turns into a motion, which turns into the discussion, which turns into the vote. But if the subcommittee has done a really good job, because they're common sense people, and they're, they're, they understand the issue, and they gain understanding of the issue, then their recommendation is almost always going to be supported because they have done such a good job of vetting out the issue. So when it comes to, again, being a safety officer and safety in a safety committee, this is, this is a fascinating piece of it is the structure. Again, without this structure in place and without having this kind of base knowledge, um, you can have committees that just run amok, and they really often do. Um, some of you may actually right now be part of those type of committees, and uh, you're probably not in your heads up and down, or you're probably going, hey, no, we run by Robert's Rule of Order, and it's great, Mike. We actually do that. Now, there are more elements to Robert's Rule of Order, and, and again, I think we'll probably end up going through that at some point because I think they're great to go through. Uh, there are some parts of Robert's Rule of Order that I think are a little constrictive, but for the most part, what I shared with you, I think have, has worked very effectively for me for the years, and has what it done it has really con made our meetings shrink in terms of frequent uh, in terms of time. Now, even frequency, as you know from those of you looking at the Joint Commission standard, um, you'll find that um, your um, meeting requirements are every or at least six times a year, or one can interpret that as every other month. And most meeting, most committees meet 12 times a year. Uh, we attempted to always meet 12 times a year, but I also understood that, you know what, there were times where we just want, needed to take a break. So maybe we only met 10 times a year, and that was okay. So we really said we would meet six times a year, and, and but we really did try to meet 12. And that was one very effective way of, you know, just making sure that, you know, you met the six, but you could use more if you had to, and you could skip a meeting if you needed to. But the other very key pieces that I started to doing my, my committees was, um, again, environmental rounds. Again, you'll find as you go through your matrix, and I'm giving you some of the assignment, that someone has to do environmental rounds. And this is a responsibility that often falls to the safety committee. And what I started to do was uh, we would meet for our meeting. Um, actually, we did it four times a year, even though you required to do it just twice a year, because I felt like that was more continuous readiness. And we would come to the meeting, and we would have a short, abbreviated meeting, probably last 15 or 20 minutes. Then we would take our environment, we would, we would, we would sign up, actually we would try to sign up before the meeting, but often that wouldn't work. So at the meeting, people would, would sign up for areas, and then the 15 to 20 members that were part of our committee would disseminate, and, and, and they would leave and go out and do environmental rounds. Now, when you think about it, if you're doing environmental rounds, and you're required to do it in non-clinical areas once a year, in clinical areas twice a year, and you have... 15 to 20 people doing them pretty easily if each area if each person takes one or two areas you'll cover 15 to 30 areas which for most facilities is the whole facility now granted there are very very large facilities and you have to come up with different models for this but this works very effectively up to a very good sized facility and then you go out and you do your environmental rounds then you come back within an hour and so you have your meeting for 15 or 20 minutes. You went out for an hour. Uh, environment around shouldn't take you more than 20 minutes to half an hour to do for an area. Uh, rare occasions may be longer, but in most cases less. So you can usually get two done. Then you come back. And what you do is you have a discussion. And we always look for trends and variances. So we would look at, okay, what were some of the trends we saw out there today? What in our organization has changed or slipped? And then we would have that discussion, and that would become very quickly part of our summation for our environmental round sheets. And then we would very quickly turn those uh, sheets and turn those into actionable items. The other thing that I would use uh, my safety meetings for is, very candidly, we would often, we would, once a year, we would have a safety retreat. And it usually, in the beginning, it lasted hmm, a little bit longer, four to six hours, and we would try to have a breakfast and, and, and a lunch, and you know, we would meet together. And we would do our hazardous vulnerability assessment and we would be do our performance improvement, and I would go over planning for um, um, for the meetings or for our management plans for our scope and objectives and performance and quality measures. And so 
that, that was a great opportunity to do that, and it built a lot of camaraderie because we would also present for each other what we were doing, you know, what we were doing for performance improvements. So people got to talk about what they were doing and also talk about what they were planning on doing and talk about results from the year before. And it would give me an opportunity to, to get them into the mode of creating their updates for my annual plan for the board because the safety committee does have to report an annual summary of safety activities and other things to the board every year. So it really, got, it really kicked that process off or gave that process momentum to get it closed out. So it was a very, very, uh, again, efficient meeting. I think folks always got a lot out of it. Um, at times, it was hard to get folks away for that period of time. Um, but it was very effective, and it built a lot of collaboration and a lot of camaraderie. So so when, you, you know, when it comes to, again, to uh, organizing and using that time and making it meaningful, I think that... Um, you know, that, that's, that's the big thing. When you look at this here, leaders identify an individual and individuals manage risk, coordinate risk reduction, activities in the physical environment, collect efficiency information, and disseminate summaries of actions and results. That what I shared with you is a very important part of this process. Now, the part that I haven't spoken to or addressed is the information that's being reported to you. And I want to talk about that just briefly. When you get information from the different management plans or the different areas of responsibility, and this was an area that I found to be, again, in many, in some ways, this is the reason why I'm doing this class, and I'm, I've come to be an instructor. I have several reasons, but this is one of them. What I found with the majority of folks who, who collected data is that it looked the same every month, month in and month out, whether it was fire drills, whether it was work orders, RPM completion rates, uh, you know, no matter what it was, it always looked the same. And, you know, it would look a little different. Maybe, you know, maybe PM rate would change a little bit, whatever. Uh, but that was always an issue for me because when I managed, I was always finding issues and opportunities to improve things. And I'm not going to belabor the point on that, but there's always opportunities to improve. And if you look, especially like if you do, like, for example, let's take fire drills. If you do fire drills the right way, you're going to you're going to basically check people's response. You know, do they have the ability to do they respond properly? Do they react properly? Do they manage the patients properly and the environment properly? And again, because healthcare is always changing employment very often, you got new people coming and going. And if you're doing your drills on every shift like you're supposed to, you're going to find people who just simply don't know what to do, and you have to train them. And you're going to find a pattern and a trend about certain training opportunities. And it always, 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 I don't know that I, I rarely, and it happened, but frequently there was always training opportunities, so there's always issues. Are you going to find part of the uh, alarm system that's not working? Um, you know, are you going to identify other issues as it relates to fire drill, if you do it correctly? And I can tell you that for the most part, I've had folks who have done drills for years, and they never find a thing wrong ever. They just kind of say everything went perfectly. And you know there's a problem because, don't get me wrong, I know things work well, but people just sometimes make errors and equipment does fail. So, you know, one of the things as a safety officer I think you have to do is you have to really help to train people to analyze information, to trend it, and to be able to speak to trends and variances. Again, that'll be another common theme throughout your time within the HFL course is trends and variances. And then be able to produce that into a, some kind of a report that changes month to month and, you know, year to year. And you see improvements even um, because of what you see and what you analyze. And so that was another issue when it comes to, I think, a very important role of a safety officer or um, a safety committee. And that is that, you know, you want to make sure that these reports that are coming to you are meaningful, uh, that they're providing you information that is helping you make decisions or measuring um, quality or safety. But more importantly, you want to make sure that the people who is looking at this information, that they have the ability to analyze it and summarize it and let you know when there's a variance or a trend. And that kind of leads to one of the last points I want to make here, and that is that when we had our safety committees, when it came to reports, um, I really made it a point not to talk about the routine data in reports. Um, I may have done that at the end of the year when we summarized the year's worth of work and effort, but I only really ever wanted to talk about variances and trends. And that was really another thing that I found that helped expedite things. You know, um, historically, when I've been to meetings, people say, 
you know, I'm working clinical engineering, and we had 252 PMs, and we completed 247 of them. Uh, 50 of those PMs were risk 1 PMs, and we completed all 50 of those risk 1 PMs. Um, we had, you know, seven could not duplicate, and we had six user errors. Um, you know, we worked on an um, anesthesia machine, and we worked on a, and they'll go on like that, routine, routine stuff. And every meeting, every single meeting. Um, I had one person that reported every single meeting until I changed it. How many pounds of recyclable um, needle boxes were recycled every, every month and then totaled it for several years? And that, that was part of the report. And, you know, I, it, it didn't mean anything to anybody in the room, but they would just say it. You know, we had 475 pounds of recyclable needle boxes this month. And that's a total of, you know, 4,755 over the last 15 months. And they'll just keep adding month after month. So, you know, that's another very important piece, I believe. Um, you know, now the downside is people get used to reporting what they do every month. And they think of the SAGE committee as an opportunity to say, hey, look what we did. Well, you know, I try to find other ways um, to find value. And the hope is, is that what you do is, 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 is you, if you get good data and you analyze good information is you do have meaningful conversations, but they're conversations about variances and trends and subcommittee activities where you're making very meaningful changes in the organization. And that's where, again, I'm probably most proud of my tenure as a safety officer in that I can tell you time after time after time after time where we focus the energy of those 15 or 20 people on a genuine problem and we fixed it. We solved it permanently. Um, it didn't, we didn't let problems become problems and just come back over and over again. We came up with solutions and most of the times we came up with permanent solutions and we put those things to bed. Occasionally we'd have things that would come back and, you know, invite us again because maybe it wasn't the right solution. But, you know, that's been part of the process too. When you think of PDCA, plan, do, check, act, you know, check and act is all about, hey, check it. Did it work? Oh, maybe it didn't work right. Well, let's act and do something different. So you go back through the PDC process. So, you know, that is normal. Um, it happens occasionally. But like I said, if it's done right, you end up taking care of a lot of problems. And I, and I like to tell you that in, in the cases where I ran the safety committee, very often our committees were so boring because we took care of a lot of the major problems and probably every year we may have had maybe two or three problems show up that we had to address. You know, in the beginning we had, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 felt it was a little overwhelming. But after a while, we didn't have many problems to address. And it, it really did get kind of boring. We'd meet, we'd have a quick conversation, we'd close. <laughs> I think I may have had at least a couple of 15, 20 minute meetings. And people would come to me, especially those that would come from other hospitals and say, I've never been to a safety meeting this short before. And I say, well, yeah, that's how we operate. But, uh... So, you know, that there, I hope, uh, in this conversation and this lecture uh, kind of gave you uh, an overview of what I believe will help you be an effective uh, safety officer, if that's the job you get, or environment of care leader, or whatever type of committee you might be over. Um, the details of the safety committee, that's in your assignment this week, uh, and that's really what I want you to drill into. I want you to find those very specific responsibilities. I touched on many of them in this conversation, but what I'm looking for you to do is the academic part, and that is to extract out of these sections those very specific responsibilities. And again, these are the delegated responsibilities. I do not want you drilling into the responsibilities as a manager or as an operational person. I want you to drill into the responsibilities as a oversight committee safety officer, sort of steering committee kind of perspective. And this is going to be a challenge. I understand that. Um, you th some of you don't necessarily have the experience to do this, but I'm hoping that through this lecture and I'm hoping through that little bit of guidance that I just gave you that uh, this will help you uh, formulate and begin to put down that layer of I'm a safety officer. And that ends uh, this presentation.